Okay, I'm going to have a go with this. You never know it might actually work. Um, thank you, uh, and uh, thanks for inviting a Scottish perspective here. Um, as you can see, I am uh, not only work for the Royal Commission, but I'm chair of the, the SHED programme board. And I'll tell you a little bit about the context of SHED and wanted to look at a few learning points that we were learning or were reinforced to us as we went along. <coughs> You see there that SHED is uh, actually encompassed within the Scottish um, SMR Forum, um, and, but these are the lead organisations groups that are part of it. <coughs> okay, I'm going to give up like everybody else did. <laughs> Um, and those who were at the um, Hair Forum meeting in Birmingham will recognise a, a bit of this, um, but there's, uh, there's extra content there for you. Um, so this is the, the position we're really all in, um, because we have inherited the, not just the data, but also the technology. And um, <coughs> the earlier you started, the more confused your data is likely to be, and the more you scared you are of um, of doing something with it in order to bring it up to date. Um, that was really the position in Scotland. Um, a few years ago we started this SURE project where um, the Royal Commission's database was actually opened up to what we call trusted users. So they can actually remotely get straight into the, um, the Canmore database and, uh, and be able to work within specific areas uh, uh, just the same as a Royal Commission employee. So that was, that was quite a, a big culture change to allow that sort of access. And that was part of the context of the Carter Report, which was commissioned by Historic Scotland. And Stephen Carter looked at the, the whole Scottish context and, uh, and started to have a sort of logical look at how you would actually sensibly um, integrate the historic environment data for the country. Um, Part of this was the concept, although I don't think he actually used the term, of the golden record. In other words, having some sort of identifier that, uh, that everybody related to, which you know, makes a lot of sense, although we know that um, you can do it geospatially now as well. Um, but also uh, talked about the ownership of that being a sort of centrally held ownership. Um, I think some of us were on CDs by then and some on MP4s, uh, so the golden record idea didn't actually go down well. And we've heard about all of, all of the <coughs> diversity that there is in the people that hold this sort of data. And you know, it's, it, it will be a big mistake if we don't take that into account. And the fact that there's a lot of independence there. People don't have to work to our systems. A lot of people out there, and I think that's increasing as we'll come up across later. So, what we actually had to do is sort of go back to first principles um, and uh, take what, what the Carter Report gave us, but have a look at the, the actual political and technical context of it. <clears throat> um, and we had, as you can see, two workshops. One was a curator's workshop where we we just basically locked all the curators from national and, and regional and local bodies in a room until we thrashed it out and came up with something that everybody was prepared to agree to. And we also took really the, the products of that to the, the users. And I think it's quite easy to forget the, who we're doing this for, what they want to use it for. Uh, and getting the technical part right is only part of the, the jigsaw. Um, we then talked about the results of those workshops um, and eventually produced a consultation document which was uh, which went through a, a proper consultation and um, we published the response collectively under the SMR forum to that. <clears throat> um, and this is the, the sort of overall aim that we had for the shed strategy. We wanted an inclusive one for the data held in Scotland and maintained by the historic environment sector. It's actually a bit more than that, as you'll see. Um, the part of the context of this was the creation of the Historic Environment Strategy for Scotland, um, which was in some ways simultaneously. Um, and you, this is the definition of the historic environment, if any of you wondered what it was. <laughs> um, and 
You know, an important part of this is the linking of associations. In other words, the historic environment is not just the physical things that are there. It's what people know and understand about it. It's intangible aspects of it. Uh, whether or not we feel as, as experts, it has uh, integrity. It, that doesn't necessarily always matter. So this, this new definition uh, accepts, really embraces the, the, the non-expert, the public aspect of it and uh, everything that goes with that. And so really does the shed strategy. Uh, I borrowed this from the historic environment strategy. This is the people um, in all sorts of different vehicles going a bit higgledy-piggledy in <laughs> roughly the same direction. And this is what we want to get to. Um, and I, I like to think of the big ship at the, the front as the SMR Forum, a collaboration, the collective uh, SMR community or historic environment record community. So uh, at the end of that journey, we created a little website here. Um, and uh, it was actually a year ago, that's the plus one in the title, uh, when our cabinet secretary uh, was able to stand up and, uh, and endorse the shed strategy. Um, not as a government strategy, it's, it's a collective one uh, and it's owned by the SMR community uh, and beyond that. Um, and please do have a look at the website, you can have a look at the strategy document itself, it's quite short, um, and, but it comes up with its own uh, vision, which was the one that was created at the, the Curators Workshop actually in 2012. Um, and you'll recognise all the blue and uh, red words, if they are still blue and red, uh, about things that we've been talking about this morning. And these are things where there's a, there's a very clear commonality of knowing what the problems are and having a think about some of the ways that we can manage them. Um, we also uh, decided to have a set of principles to work to, as well as uh, aims and objectives. And uh, again, these, these are summarised, but you can see what the main, main points that are in here uh, gel not only with the vision, but also with everything we've been talking about. You know, curation, partnership, collaboration, standards, looking after the data uh, and making sure it talks to each other. Uh, so we have these uh, uh, the principles really embedded within the five aims of the shared strategy and each of these aims has a number of objectives underneath it, which I won't go into because that's not actually the point of the talk. One of the key things that we had to do, and the, really the thing that went wrong with the first attempt, was to see what the roles and responsibilities were of the people involved in this. And these are the people who, who hold the data, and uh, it's only a subset of the people with an interest in it, but we, we uh, this was where we locked into the curator's workshop uh, and came up with something that we were all comfortable with in principle. I think you know, there's, there are different um, relationships that we have with different parts of the, the same community of interest. So this is not a, a definition of the rules and responsibilities. It just helps us to, um, to have a common language about it. Uh, and some of this will need to be thrashed out in, in uh, in real life. However, it was really important, fundamentally important, to establish what the rules and responsibilities were and to agree them with the, the group who had most influence in the subject area. Um, so the, the bit at the top here shows the, um, how the, the strategy works and how our programme is uh, helping deliver it, using the principles of managing successful programmes um, and the Shed Programme Board has that sort of membership. You'll see it's quite a diverse membership and uh, thinking again about this is not just about the physical archaeology and, uh, and buildings and historic landscapes. Two minutes, right? <laughs> um, but it's about a lot more than that. It's about records, archives, museums, um, all, of, all of that together. Um, we put a long timetable on this um, because there's a lot going on. There's a lot of turmoil, uh, and I know this relates uh, in throughout the UK, um, caused by the, the credit crunch and so on. There's a lot of change, and we felt that we didn't want to... We had to take that into account in our programming. <clears throat> um, where we are just now is that we have some things that are ongoing, 
Um, and we have an action plan which looks a bit like that, but we're building up and we will take to the, the group of stakeholders later in the year. Um, we have obviously built on existing foundations past map. You'll sort of recognize that, that uh, because it looks like historic Wales, um, where we're pulling together all the data and um, effectively a, a, a mini GIS for the, the country. That's working well. Um, we already had a technical working group for the SMR forum looking at all the standards that, uh, that you uh, will know about. <clears throat> and just to stop on this one for a few seconds, <laughs> um, this recognizes that the same site is looked at in different ways, legitimately by different constituents. And the, um, one of the things we want to grapple with is the polygonization of our records, because having dots is not really very useful. Having polygons is much more useful, especially uh, for overlapping. Um, and um, we've come to terms with the fact that we have different uses for our polygons. And we now have a, a project, which I can go into uh, later, where we will polygonize uh, for the country, we hope, um, but also in the process of that, do the concordance, do the uh, data quality upgrades, and do it in a consistent way, which probably will have different three, two or three different types of polygons, probably two that need to be made. Um, one for the national record of the known site extents and one for trigger maps for local authorities. Um, other people's data, we've heard a, a little bit about that. Um, discovery and excavation in Scotland is actually other people's data which have been feeding into the national record since 1947. Um, it's now online. It's the same really form that people filled in uh, manually, but it's got a much better relationship with our national record. Um, we'll hear a little more about uh, this later on, but there's a lot of commonality, a lot of synergy with what I've just said. Um, and uh, the principles on the face of it look quite similar. There are different solutions, I think, for different countries, and uh, that we have to accept that. But I think there'll be lots of continuing lively discussion about that. So just, sorry, I'm overrunning slightly, but just to say what my main learning points were that I thought would be interesting to get across here. Um, one is that we're, we decided that we were not going to go the whole hog and look at the quality of the content of the records because that is too big. It's already a big thing that we're looking at because of the legacy of, of um, difficult data that we've got. Um, I emphasized already the importance of not just understanding, but agreeing the roles and responsibilities, being in the room and making sure that local, national, regional museums, others understand how they fit into this and, and accept that so that um, we can't all do everything. Um, thinking about the sector, to museums, to archives, um, and um, also thinking about other community interests, including intangible heritage interests, where that links to physical places. I think that we've done the right thing not to rush this. Um, it doesn't mean to say we're not doing anything or waiting to start. Um, we're already doing quite a lot, um, but we're, we're doing it in a sensible period of time. Um, and what we've seen is that suddenly somebody's doing a project which is really relevant to what we want to do. Um, we do our horizon scanning, we pull those projects in, look at the synergies and, uh, and make extra capital out of them. Um, PassMap was an example of building on existing foundations where we can. But the technology is always changing. And I think we sometimes forget that those changes are, are happening so quickly that they, today's context, you think, why on earth are we not doing X? Well, two or three years ago, we couldn't have done X. We couldn't even think about doing X. Maybe we should be anticipating the technology a bit more, but not just how it's used, but what the users want. And I think the, the explosion in, in community groups producing data that we're interested in and yet not in proper collaboration is a problem that we have to recognize. We also have to recognize those constraints in terms of um, time and money. And one last thing, honestly, 
I think what this has pointed out to me is that as a, as a profession, we need to have a think about culture changes. Because what underlay the whole problem here was the relationship, the behaviours of the different constituents here. And it goes beyond the data. We've got to behave properly amongst ourselves. And I think it's up to the, the leaders in the different parts of the sector to be aware of uh, behaviour which is not constructive and to do something about it. You know, you don't need to confront it, but you can do something about it so that we all work together because we're all doing it for the same purpose and we should be working better together. Thank you. Thank you.